So hi everyone, my name is James Thomas. I'm a final year PhD student in Mike Blackman's lab at the Francis Crick Institute. And I'm gonna to present to you today some of the key data from my PhD project, which I've titled, A Protease Cascade Regulates Egress of the Malaria Parasite from the Host Red Blood Cell. And so very briefly, I'm sure many of you are at least familiar with the fact that malaria is a devastating disease of global importance. It's caused by various species of the genus Plasmodium, which is a eukaryotic pathogen spread by the bite of mosquitoes. It causes more than half a million deaths per year, and as it stands, we have no good vaccine and the emergence of resistance to our frontline chemotherapies. So there's an, a continued need to understand more about the biology of this important pathogen. And these parasites have complex and convoluted life cycles, but in the lab, we just focus on one part of this life cycle. It's the asexual blood stage cycle. And in this stage, these invasive merozoic forms of the parasite actively invade red blood cells. They then reside within a parastophorus vacuole bound by a parastophorus vacuole membrane. And over the course of 48 hours, they <coughs> develop through multiple stages, eventually forming many daughter merozoites, which are collectively called the schizont. Now, eventually, these merozoites must escape the confines of the depleted red blood cell to go on and infect fresh cells and propagate their population. And we can watch this process by time-lapse video microscopy. And so this part, this lytic destruction of the red blood cell is also responsible for all the clinical symptoms of malaria. And for these reasons, we have a keen interest in understanding more about the biology of this part of the parasite's life cycle. And so um, just to look at egress specifically for a minute, um, it's a two-step process requiring the sequential rupture first of the parastophorus vacuole membrane, then of the erythrocyte membrane. And it's been known for some considerable time that this process is protease dependent. And at the outset of my project, we knew of one confirmed parasite protease called sub-1, which is stored in these organelles in merozoites called exonemes, and that about 10 to 15 minutes before erythrocyte rupture, it's discharged into the parasophorus vacuole in which the parasites reside. And here it cleaves numerous substrates. Now, we have pretty good evidence that sub-1 is important for regress because pharmacological blockade of it or prevention of the secretion of these organelles prevents egress. Now, one of the substrates of sub-1 is a putative papain-like cysteine protease called Cirrus 6. And previous work in Mike's lab has found that the catalytic cysteine residue and the sub-1 processing sites in Cirrus 6 could not be disrupted. Also, work on a rodent malaria ortholog displayed an autocatalytic-like activity in vitro. And we know that E64 treatment of parasites prevents egress. And so all of these data allowed us to build a hypothetical model for what we think is going on at egress. We know that sub-1 cleaves Cirrus 6 when it's discharged into the parastophorus vacuole. And Cirrus 6 looks like a functional protease. And so we hypothesize that this represents a activation step converting zymogen form of Cirrus 6 to active protease form, and we predict that it goes on to cleave substrates that are directly or indirectly involved in leading to egress. And so, in order to address any of these hypotheses, I've made use of the recently established dimerizable Cree recombinase system in Plasmodium falciparum, which is the first robust and reliable system of conditional mutagenesis we've had. And so, what I've done is um, introduce LOX-P sites uh, into these gene loci, the sub-1 and the Cirrus 6 genes independently. And what that means is that upon activation of Cree recombinase activity, the intervening regions of DNA are excised. And what I find is that this results in complete loss of protein in two independent clones in both cases. And so obviously, first of all, I wanted to establish how important these genes are to the parasite and using a plaque assay, which I developed and we've recently published, I was able to see dramatic reductions in plaque formation in, uh, when the genes are knocked out, either sub-1 or Cirrus 6, compared to control cultures. So very obviously, these two genes are essential to the asexual blood stage of the parasite. I was also able to complement these phenotypes, and I was able to validate that lethal phenotype that I saw in both cases. And so if I Put, uh, if I complement the knockout parasites with either a wild-type copy of the Cirrus 6 gene or a wild-type copy of the sub-1 gene in the Cirrus 6 and sub-1 knockouts respectively, I can restore plaque formation. 
and you can see that this doesn't happen when you put in an empty vector control. It does nothing. And so having predicted that these two genes are involved in egress, obviously I wanted to examine this by time-lapse video microscopy. And so in the case of sub-1 knockout parasites, what we see is that indeed they fail to undergo egress. And interestingly, they seem to arrest at a stage where it seems the PVM is still intact. So you don't see these free merozoites within an erythrocyte membrane. You can see this bumped region here represents the parastophorus vacuole. And so that's interesting because it, it shows that the sub-1 is essential for PVM rupture. I also did the same for the serous 6 knockout parasites. And again, these serous 6 knockout parasites are unable to egress, but the arrest is, the phenotype is different. You can see free merozoites within an erythrocyte membrane. And so this demonstrates that while the serous 6 is not necessary for PVM rupture, it is essential for rupture of the erythrocyte membrane. And so now, if you remember from a few moments ago in the introduction, I said to you that previous work had shown that the catalytic cysteine and the sub-1 processing sites in the serous 6 gene could not be disrupted. But that was done without the benefit of this conditional system that we now have, and so really that data was not definitive. So I wanted to revisit this and see if I could use the complementation system I'd used to, to address this question. And so what I found was that in the same way that I've already showed you, where I tried to complement these uh, knockouts with their wild-type gene, I also wanted to see whether I could complement the serous 6 knockout with either a mutant form where the catalytic cysteine is converted to an alanine, which is expected to ablate protease activity in a cysteine protease scaffold, or a mutant form where the sub-1 processing sites had been disrupted. And what I find is that in both cases, I cannot complement with these mutant forms. So this suggests that um, the serous 6 is indeed a protease, and that the sub-1 processing of serous 6 is necessary for its function. I'm also able to show that wild-type normal egress is restored with the wild-type serous 6 gene, and that the alanine mutant, the alanine mutant complementation merely results in the same serous 6 knockout phenotype. And so, I just want to leave you with one last piece of data, really. Um, and so, having seen these serous 6 knockout parasites arrest at a seemingly late stage in the egress pathway, I wanted to try and understand how far these parasites develop normally. And I did numerous experiments, um, and I'm just going to present to you this one here, which I think is kind of indicative of them. And so, it has been published that in this pathway of egress, there is this phenomenon of erythrocyte membrane poration. And so what you find is that, in fact, seconds before egress occurs, the erythrocyte membrane becomes porated, and you can visualize this by seeing when fluorescently labeled phylloidin, which binds to the F-actin on the cytoskeleton, is able to enter the cell. And so this is a control culture that I've treated with E64 so to prevent egress, so you can better visualize this compared to if they just egressed. And what we see is that the serous 6 knockout parasites also undergo this process completely normally. And so this suggests, for a start, that this process, although the significance of it is not sure, that serous 6 is not necessary for it. And it also acts as a temporal marker. Um, and because this happens normally seconds before these erythrocytes rupture, it tells us that these parasites, along with other experiments I've done, show that these parasites develop completely normally up to a very late stage indeed. And so it seems to suggest that 